I can't remember it. The 450 million farmer opportunity, large scale change through smallholder finance panel. Um, I, my name is Tom Carroll. I'm with the Initiative for Smallholder Finance. Um, here with me are Mikhail Vanderberg from Triros, uh, Willie Foote from Root Capital, Laura McKenney from IFC, and Sean DeClean from Yara International. And uh, I will give them an opportunity to introduce themselves at greater length in a minute. Um, but just want to do two things. First, uh, just a show of hands, who's active in the smallholder farming and agriculture business right now? All right, excellent. Um, who is actively working with MNCs? Who is a funder? Excellent. Who is a social entrepreneur? Terrific. Okay, we got a good mix. Um, so in prepping for this discussion, uh, I went back and I watched the panel from 2012 uh, called From Farm to Plate. Uh, and that panel featured Dana Bogus from the Gates Foundation, um, Gary Milstead from Nestle, uh, Rick Pizer from Green Mountain Coffee, and uh, I think the only legacy here is Willie Foote. Um, I had a lot of hair then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you won't recognize me now. The, uh, but it was interesting going back and watching that footage because uh, although it was only two years ago, the framing of the conversation was pretty basic. And I'm not sure if Bamba Nibale is here, actually. He was moderating the discussion. Um, it was about what were the incentives for participation among uh, actors across the supply chain? Um, how does finance fit in to that? How does it work? And kind of what's going to happen next? Um, and given the composition of the panel, the focus was pretty heavily on coffee. Um, though there, the conversation did stray into other commodities, there was a pretty big emphasis on coffee. Um, some of the themes that are very relevant today in terms of like the importance of the farmer, shared value, uh, relationships across the supply chain, are an uh, integration of different actors on the supply chain. We're touched on in that discussion, but I think uh, from a very different perspective than we might think about them today, and I think that's going to be important in the conversation as we go forward. Um, in the 85th minute of that discussion, I did take notes. The, uh, uh, Rich, um, uh, Rich from Echo Green, Echoing Green asked, uh, has anyone discussed, has anyone addressed the state of the market? Um, and uh, how big is it? Just very fundamental questions. Um, and Willie, I think, got the question, and he very artfully dodged it um, <laughs> by saying, I'm going to dodge this question. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I think it was because that work hadn't been done yet. And so enter a parade of folks at the spurring of Willie, uh, Graham McMillan from the City Foundation, Edwin O, uh, myself, and a uh, host of my Dahlberg colleagues. And we wrote a report called Catalyzing Smallholder Agricultural Finance to frame that market. Um, the, and actually, subsequently, the initiative that I now work for is, uh, has been spawned from that report. The initiative, the, the report did a couple things. One was uh, it sized the market. It put a number on it, 450 million opportunity. It also went down into the logic that, that Willie had laid out that day, which is all right, what's really addressable in that. And we sized it about 22 million, or 22 billion, excuse me. Um, the, uh, and, um, we let, outlined, you know, what is the state of play and what are the five pathways for taking this forward? Um, where the pathways where those who are interested in putting capital in to grow the market could think about the best opportunities. And those five pathways broke down really quickly in a nutshell. One, the social lender community. Uh, how do they replicate their model in terms of additional customers or, or within their customer base or additional geographies? Secondly, long-term finance. How do you track that nut? Uh, third, vertically integrated supply chains with multinational companies. Um, fourth, alternate aggregation points. Uh, so where outside of the formally organized farmer communities can we begin to think about tapping the market for uh, finance? And that's you know, input financing, uh, warehouses, equipment financing. Uh, and the last of which was direct to farmer. 
Um, the last two of these were by necessity of trying to address the 90%, 80-90% of the market that is unorganized. Um, so I think we have a really good representation of that, uh, those pathways both within and across the pathways, but obviously given the show of hands early in uh, this discussion, we've got a lot of, of uh, experience and talent in the, in the room to talk about that. And I think a good outcome here is uh, a broker democratic discussion among all of the participants in the room. So we'll start with the panelists and we have a series of questions that we'll get to with them, but I think an open dialogue with the participants here will, will serve us all well. So with that, Mikhail. Yeah, okay. So my name is Michael van den Berg. I, um, I work for Triodos Investment Management. We're based out of the, out of the Netherlands. For those who, who don't know us as an institution, we were founded in 1980 the bank was at the very principles of what today is is called impact investing um but before it was coins i guess uh, i wasn't there i mean not that the part of that group but the people there came up with the idea is that finance should actually work uh, should be put to work to create positive change in society being it on an ecological level social or cultural level so anything and everything we do should be should be resonating along those those dimensions and actually the very first loan that the bank issued was uh, to finance a farmer uh, in the Netherlands who wanted to convert from conventional farming to organic farming, but the traditional, uh, the, the other banks didn't want to uh, finance that, that very gap. We've made a long journey since then, since 1980, um, uh, from uh, putting money to work in the Netherlands, now in five different countries in Europe, and starting with an investment management uh, arm as well, where I'm part of, where we have 19 funds under management. And one of those funds, again, is very much to the core of where the bank started. That's about food and agriculture. How can we bring about positive change in the food and agricultural sector? And partly that's in, um, sorry, but we call it emerging markets still. I've been told yesterday by, the, uh, <coughs> by Arif that we should call that global growth markets. Uh, but where we, where, how can we finance uh, in emerging markets, food and agriculture? And that's with the fund that I'm part of, uh, where I'm, I'm responsible for actually, is the Triadal Sustainable Trade Fund. So that's the journey that we've come uh, from the Netherlands to what we try to well discuss here today. Excellent. Yeah. Willie. Uh, so yeah, I'm Willie Foote. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'm founder and CEO of Root Capital. And we're an um, impact first agricultural lender working in Africa and Latin America. So our mission is to grow prosperity right in rural areas, in poor environmentally vulnerable places. And we do that by lending to small and growing agricultural businesses that are kind of caught in this missing middle between microfinance and the banks, and by building their capacity through financial management training. So um, where we started uh, in this journey uh, is in trade finance, much like Chiodos, in exportable cash crop value chains, coffee, cocoa, cashews, <coughs> shea butter, uh, honey, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, since our founding well over a decade ago now, we've dispersed a total of about $650 million to 500 enterprises, and 72% of that is short-term trade finance, where you're lending against forward contracts with, with buyers, uh, the Starbucks, the Whole Foods, uh, et cetera. And the, the market has really, smallholder finance market, has really evolved around trade finance. And it makes sense because it's kind of like the oxygen that allows enterprise to breathe. But as we know, with a lot of oxygen, plenty of oxygen, you can still be very weak and anemic uh, and with stunted growth. Right, so how have we evolved uh, from there, from, from the straight trade finance? So increasingly in the context of Tom's remarks and those five growth pathways, we've been innovating in two adjacent uh, areas, and in both cases trying to reach a much bro kind of broader range of, of financing needs. Um, adjacency one is long-term loans, right, in our known export value chains. And so on the one hand, that is more focus on capital expenditure, on infrastructure processing plants, uh, equipment and so on. And on the other hand, it's long-term loans for farm renovation. That is farmers building resilience and making investments in yield and productivity on the farm to improve uh, you know, soil health, to renovate distressed old plant stock, especially in the face of, of climate change, and always kind of with the support of the agricultural business aggregators, i.e. our clients. Right? So that's, that's adjacency one. Adjacency two for us as we move beyond trade finance is local value chains for staple 
uh, food crops and related, uh, related products. We launched last year our food security and nutrition portfolio, which we spent about a year and a half uh, incubating before that. Um, so that's you know, targeting agricultural businesses that are linking in not to global supply chains, but local supply chains for rising domestic consumption of nutritious foods. And we have kind of four target uh, areas there. Agri-input, so like improved seed, um, so soil and plant health products. Second, staple crop production, so millet, sorghum, rice. Um, third, um, post-harvest handling and storage. And then finally, agro agro-processors. Oops, OK, lessons learned for us really quickly. Um, let me just say, as an, as an, uh, um, imp uh, an impact first agricultural lender, but especially being offshore, albeit deeply embedded in local talent and local markets, it's tough to move into these adjacencies. Um, there are a bunch of challenges. I'll highlight a couple or a few. Cap CapEx lending challenges, one collateral, right? How do you find a sufficient collateral when you don't have traditional hard assets available, right? In trade credit, you're lending against purchase orders and forward contracts and cash flow. Documentation. How do you, do how do you document security in each country versus you know, under US or European uh, law vis-a-vis -vis kind of trade finance, right? And it's much more um, lengthy process and your ability to liquidate assets is questionable. Um, monitoring. With trade credit, you're monitoring typically the export, uh, the harvest and the export period, right? That's generally sufficient. If you're doing long-term loans, you have to have much more local monitoring capability to understand financial performance, um, covenant compliance, and so on. So that's much more complex. And, and next, renovation lending challenges. First, how about it's a partnership with God? Right? You're taking on direct uh, uh, agricultural production risk. Insurance products, not available typically for smaller farmers, especially in tree crops, like coffee, coffee or cocoa. Internal credit systems. If you're going to lend seven years, 10 years for renovation of a farm that's been hit by coffee leaf rust, you, you really need to have an internal credit system, uh, like a credit union within a farmer cooperative to lend to those uh, individual farmers. So you need financial advisory services. And often that's a pretty expensive process. You have a techno server or somebody else that needs to provide that. Lastly, agronomic technical assistance, right? Um, in coffee, cocoa, and beyond, clients will often require this if you're going to renovate farms. You need to have support in varietal selection, in uh, nurseries management, and plant health programs. Uh, and if, as a lender, if those aren't in place, you are seriously exposed. You're, you're in trouble. So conclusion, if there's one thing that we've learned in the face of these challenges over the years, uh, it is that partnerships are absolutely critical doing anything in value chain finance. And that includes bread and butter uh, trade finance. So while the chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and in the case of trade finance, uh, the most important partnership there, you might argue, is the buyer. But that's actually an oversimplification. You have traders. You often have certifiers, right? You have um, technical assistance providers, among others. And all of them play a critical role in having an ecosystem, a value chain ecosystem that is healthy enough to support uh, financing. And going forward, and, I, and I'll wrap here, in my mind, in the face of climate change, in the face of uh, price and uh, currency volatility, uh, in the face of, of civil conflict, and as we are trying to catalyze the smallholder agricultural finance industry and move across that continuum from growth pathway one all the way to five, we must go right to new, a whole new level of blueprints for collaboration. We must move away from or move beyond, if you will, efficient, comfortable, but low impact partnerships. And one could argue triangulation for trade finance with buyers is an efficient, comfortable, and low impact partnership. We need to keep doing that. Buyers in the room, please don't get me wrong. Uh, and I speak on behalf of all of the, the, uh, my peer institutions here and I know this, but we need to go to complex and messy and uncomfortable and industry-wide and deeply impactful blueprints for collaboration. We've got a couple of examples of those which I can share in the, in the Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Laura. Great. Laura. Thanks. Uh, my name is Laura McKenney, and I'm with the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. And just to remind you, the twin goals of the World Bank Group are to eradicate poverty and to increase and boost shared prosperity. And that includes IFC. Oftentimes, people look at us at IFC saying, oh, you guys just want to make money. Well, we definitely want to make money, but we also want to uh, push the development objectives and development agenda that we have as a core principle to ISC. 
Um, I sit in the industry department for agribusiness for IFC, and agribusiness at IFC is about a $4 billion a year business. Half of that is through direct agri-investments with producers, with uh, fertilizing companies, with traders, and the other half is through our financial intermediaries. We do a lot of business through financial intermediaries with IFC, and about $2 billion a year is for agribusiness. Um, so uh, I just wanted to talk to you about something special that's happening within IFC and what, what I head. I head um, something called the Global Agriculture Food Security Program. Uh, IFC is heading the private sector window of this global program. The global program is actually being supported by about 10 governments plus the Gates Foundation. It's raised about a billion dollars that has been distributed to governments, to countries through the public sector window to help with the country-led agenda of how to improve and increase agriculture investment. IFC instead is heading the private sector effort there. And what it enables us to do at IFC is actually to take a little more risk to get a little more messy, to work with partners. For us, a messy partner actually is through capital for IFC. So under the, <laughs> we're getting messy with, with Willie under this partnership. Because under uh, the GAFSB private sector window, we have funding from governments that's been given to us, about $300 million at concessional terms. Uh, IFC is normally a commercial investor, and we, we really do believe in the, um, the thesis that commercial private sector investing can be both profitable and it can be developmentally impactful. In the space of agriculture and in other spaces like SME financing and climate change, we know that there's a lot of public goods out there that have to be shared by many, many partners. And I think that's an important point that Willie brought up. So under the, the, the GAFSB private sector window, we have that government money that we can have uh, deployed at softer terms, at concessional terms. And that way we can take more risks. We can start doing smaller scale uh, projects, working with smaller um, companies that IFC normally wouldn't be able to do. We're, and we're doing this all to push ahead the agenda of working with smallhold farmers, working with SME farmers to increase their livelihoods. Because we really do believe that sustainable financial solutions in the space of every business is the way that we can all impact <coughs> in a positive and sustainable way uh, to improve their lives. So I'll end there. I'll look forward to the discussion. Sean. Um, so my name's Sean DeClean. I work for Yara, which often many people haven't heard of, but it's the world's sort of most global fertilizer company. Not normally sitting in a room, you know, at the Skoll Forum on finance. Um, <clears throat> but why I, I'm here today is that we realized uh, as a company a number of years ago that we had to engage uh, in a tri in, in, if we were going to work in Africa, which we had been for 20 or 30 years, uh, it was going to require a very different way of working, very much to you know, what Willie is talking to, uh, around looking at how do you engage in transformational partnerships? How do you address the complexity of change that is you know, African smallholder agriculture at scale and at the sort of speed of change that's going to be required? as a company, which we you know, have a limited role to play. And, um, and so that brought us into initiatives uh, that very much you know, championed from African countries themselves, whether these were the need for agricultural growth corridors and using the existing infrastructure that was there to create national regional markets. Uh, and, and that then, you know, brought a very quick reaction for the need for catalytic financing if you were going to create a, uh, a pipeline of uh, SME investment. Uh, and so you saw, you know, players, which I'm looking at Chris, you know, AgDevCo, you know, coming in right from the very start uh, on this. Out of that, that led to those initiatives which started in Mozambique and Tanzania, led those presidents to, you know, really push ahead for a broader Africa investment agenda that was been very much Africa led, which saw, you know, players uh, like uh, Ethiopia uh, and so Khalid Bomba from the Agricultural Transformation Agency is here with African countries really driving what their investment strategy was for agriculture, which very much has smallholder farmers, you know, very central to that. And so that coalesced around an initiative called Grow Africa. 
And so initially that was really to try and, right, how do you, uh, you know, create an investment flow into Africa? And this has been happening now for the last couple of years and we've seen, you know, several billion dollars worth of commitments having, you know, come through with that, a lot of it being actualized, a lot of rethinking in terms of what are the business models that are going to be required for that to achieve the sort of scale and to meet the expectation that is there from, uh, from African countries. And, uh, and at the heart of that was then the issue of finance, was that agricultural rural finance was potentially one of the biggest bottlenecks for achieving scale. And we saw that ourselves. We, we initiated in Ghana a smallholder farmer maize partnership, uh, and, uh, which is now about four years ago, which now has over 10,000 farmers involved. At the moment, we could not scale that any further because there is no financing for, for this initiative. It's being pre-financed uh, as it stands because the mechanisms weren't there. That led us, and this is where the partnership aspect came into a series of individualized discussions with uh, different players in, in the context of Grow Africa, which is a partnership between the African Union and uh, NEPAD and, uh, and the CADEP agenda under that and the World Economic Forum to try and figure out what this sort of transformational partnership space would, uh, would, would look like. And, uh, and one of the key focus areas in the last few months has been finance. And so there was a, at the African Green Revolution Forum uh, meeting last September, a number of the players got together. Uh, and that included, you know, players like CARE, uh, <coughs> with their Access Africa uh, village savings and loans scheme who have three million farmers, uh, three million individuals involved in that would like to take it up to 30 million in the next five to 10 years and feel that they have the methodology to now do that. Uh, players like Equity Bank, you know, a very successful Kenyan bank, you know, that has gone out and, you know, reached out to smallholder farmers particularly. Opportunity International Bank. And, uh, and then more mainstream players like Rabobank and uh, Barclays Africa, you know, IDCs like the IFC and, um, uh, sorry, DFIs like, uh, you know, IFC and the IDC in South Africa. And, uh, and, and now you're seeing players like Vodafone come in and, you know, the credit card players you know, Root Capital have now joined in uh, to, to this group, along with a number of companies as well, Yara and Syngenta and some of the off-takers, Unilever and that, you know, to, to sort of look at this. But what was fascinating when they first came together for the first lunch last September was there had never been this conversation around a table. It, no, we hadn't sat down individually as players and said, what is everyone's different role in this? And so if you are going to have a complex type partnership, the type that Willie was talking about, you know, I mean, even just meeting was quite revolutionary. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, the, the, uh, the innovation, the big innovation we realised, there wasn't some new product, it wasn't going to be, it was actually potentially figuring out what is the alignment of all of these places and how do you create a blueprint, you know, where you can work together, what does the platform look like? It's not going to be on one term sheet necessarily, where you're all working on one project together along one, you know, value chain. It's more, is there a space, you know, at a country level where you can come together and what are the regulatory frameworks that would progress that or inhibit that? What is the role of blended finance? You know, are the funds there? Are the donors even set up? At the moment, an organisation like IFAD, you know, under the UN, it's not allowed to lend directly to the, the private sector or to a farmer's organisation under its, you know, rules of engagement. It has to go through government. So, you know, a lot of the, and they would like to see that change. So a lot of the you know, the, the agenda was also just this, you know, how do we actually start to work together? And that's also looking beyond the finance industry to include players like a fertiliser company that, you know, where he farmers, it's often a heavy part of their initial cost is that, you know, is, is that sort of buying of, you know, inputs, farm inputs, whether it's seed or fertiliser or whatever. Uh, and so how do you bring that whole conversation together? And that was really why I ended up sitting here today. Thank you, and welcome. And that certainly sounds messy. <laughs> the, uh, um, but I think we'll get into that because I have some questions that I think we should explore around who leads. Um, does that get unwieldy when you're trying to, to do this? But I want to 
uh, bring us back to the 2012 conversation very briefly. Uh, Willie, I've heard you use the term or the phrase, and you've used it in the past, pathological collaboration. And in 2012, uh, you said that was nascent. Um, so as we're talking and exploring this idea of partnership more directly, um, how do you see those partnerships, whether they're the humble and easy ones or the more uh, hardcore, or hardcore might not be the term, messy or unlikely partnerships, how have you seen that evolve over the last couple of years? Well, I, I think I'll <clears throat> take that in a slightly different direction because we can drill down on what these messy partnerships look like across the kaleidoscopic uh -huh. you know, value chain ecosystem. Um, but I would say probably the most pathologically collaborative thing that we've been involved with, which is a very important thing, um, is that so we have actually a number of peer institutions in the room who are impact first agricultural lenders. Um, there's Mauricio from Responsibility, Malcolm uh, from Shared Interest, um, and I think all of us probably share the following, which is yes, lend. Yes, in many cases, advise on financial management training or whatever, and of course, work with others to crowd in other uh, training. But all of it doesn't add up to much if you're not trying to catalyze an industry. And uh, in the last couple of years, we had a tough. All of us had a tough year. Paul Rice knows this from Fred Trade USA. Tough year last year in coffee. The, the coffee market went a little crazy. Uh, and so to come together with your peer institutions, uh, who you're actually competing with. And competition is great because it drives dynamism and innovation, but it can be tough, right? To come together with your institutions and actually create uh, a blueprint for your industry uh, and, and say, okay, hang on, what are the things that help the microfinance industry to, uh, to scale? They were collaborative behavior and they were blueprinting standards and responsible lending practices, unified voice advocacy platform, and uh, I'm going to break protocol. If I can, if I can call on Malcolm sure. to just really briefly talk about what it is that we've been up to, but it's probably the best example and the least comfortable <laughs> <laughs> example of pathological collaboration, at least in our institutional history. <laughs> I'm sorry to put you on the spot, Malcolm. You did sit in the front row. Thanks, Willie. <laughs> yeah. Bad, bad spot. Um, so yeah, I think it was probably a couple of years ago that uh, Willie and uh, Mikhail's pre predecessor at Trilos sort of, you know, said. We know each other. We've known each other for 10 plus years. In, in we're working in the same sort of space, and we are, you know, crossing over, bumping up against each other, particularly on the ground uh, in Africa and Latin America and Central America and so on. Um, but we all are capturing the same sort of thoughts about what can we do about making this work better together. There's a little, you know, there have been opportunities uh, where two of our organisations have worked together, and we there were there are seven of us that, that have come together um, as a, a as a group um, and met four or five times um, now to try and, as, as Willie says, capture the essence of a competition, but also collaboration. Where, where, do we, where do we work well together? What can we do in terms of um, structuring ourselves that works um, for the benefit, not of ourselves, but for the benefit of the smallholder farmers? That's, that's the key bit that we're trying to change. So it's, it's actually having you know, less of an impact in the wrong, in the sense of the areas where we don't want to have an impact, so that you know, can we collaborate in terms of due diligence on uh, looking at uh, new lending? Where can we, w you know, work together on that? With the, with the challenge about, you know, we're not creating some sort of cartel here, but we're understanding how each of us are, is operating, and we're at the beginning of that. And really, we just come to, the, you know, this this point of, of wanting to launch ourselves and say, you know, we are we are a group that's come together um, for that. Is that. Maybe share our annoying acronym. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're, we're known as um, CSAF, um, <laughs> so well, we spent a long time wondering, wondering where we should get, get to. Uh, the, the Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance, um, and many that you could bound, bandy around, you know, many names, but that we just felt, as, as a group, we've sort of devised what we feel are some res responsible lending practices um, that, that work well for us, they work well for um, producer groups, smallholder farmers, um, and this is almost the beginning platform. We're here. We've, we've, you know, we've announced ourselves, and actually, we, we've worked closely with uh, the Dahlberg team in terms of what, how do you take those pathways forward? Uh, and they've been very helpful at looking at the data that we hold on our set on our own uh, portfolios and, and um, analyze that um, to see what is our collective um, impact. You know, that we realized early on that was a danger. We were going to, you know claim you know, massive impacts that's actually, you know, four or five of us are already lending uh, to the same producer group and having the same impact. 
So they've been, been through that data and, and pulled it all apart to make sure we're not overclaiming um, things, which, is a, which is a, you know, was a big challenge, I think. And uh, well, well done for the team that have been working their way through that, because I don't think we had it very well laid out in a way that was neat to, to play with. Does that help? Yeah, thank you very much. It, it, may I add to that? Sure. It's just not that we're breaking protocol anyway, so <laughs> we're in a... I mean, we're in a messy, in a messy panel here, but... Um, <laughs> we'll crush you eventually. So. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll watch out for that, Tom. Um, now, what I, uh, what I find interesting, what, what Willie said, and what also Malcolm said, is that this notion of, of competition, and, and um, it's a bit odd in a way, but it's definitely true. We are competitors, I in a way, but also very much not, because in the end of the day, we have a, and we have, we're, we're striving for also a social impact, for a social mission here. So instead of looking at pieces of the pie or whatever, slices of a pizza, we're trying to make the, actually that pie or that pizza much bigger. I'd be, we at Tritos would be extremely happy if eventually we can grow that market without our share in it. Um, so that's where indeed the notion of competition is. It's definitely there. There's a feeling of competition which is good. It's healthy indeed, as you said. But it's, it, uh, the topic is much bigger than, than our institutions. So we're, we're here really to crowd in as many as possible through uh, indeed, what, what we do, partnerships, etc. So I just wanted to indeed, Great. jump in on that. Uh, and if I, I could add, I think that what has actually gotten us to this space is, is the <coughs> fact that we are from different places and the divergent voices. And I can tell you from our experience, IFC, sitting on this Global Agriculture Food Security Program, GAFSPE, which is a, very wor is a worse acronym, <laughs> acronym than your acronym, GAFSPE is comprised of uh, uh, recipient governments, lending uh, governments and institutions. It's uh, also comprised of CSOs, and it's comprised of IFC, representing the private sector. CSOs were very skeptical about IFC's presence, to be very honest with you. They, they, they were saying, yeah, by IFC, you just lend to the big guys. You just do equity investments to make money. They've been challenging us to do something more, to make, to make, to make <coughs> IFC create new uh, partnerships and new clients and, and ways to work better and differently than we have before. We also have EFAD on uh, the steering committee, and EFAD is an interesting agency. I mean, it is dedicated to smallhold farmers, and yet they can't work with the private sector in our sense of the word. They can't make financial investments. So we're partnering with them to kind of try and figure out how we can dance together in a better way, more effective way. They're, they're, they can't wait to, help, to work with IFC knowing that we can bring larger clients, we can bring offtake agreements, and they can bring us producer organizations that we can then match make somehow. So it's been, I think the, the, the interesting thing right now is that there's a lot of different voices in the room and we each come with our own sort of agenda, but we also come with an ability now to say, okay, we're ready to collaborate and we're ready to start, to, to start dancing together to see if we can find a, new ways to work together. I think that's the interesting thing. Also then I think the pathway, one of the other pathways is working with, um, I think it's pathway three, working with yeah. outgrower programs and larger companies. So IFC is never afraid to work with larger companies, but what we do challenge larger companies is how do you reach smallhold farmers in your supply chain, in your value chain? And, and how can you do that in a sustainable way? So IFC comes to the table with our environmental and social standards, and we come with our, an agenda to, to get those companies to push down further and to make the pie bigger, to reach more smallhold farmers. Because if it is a 450 million, million person, million farmer challenge, all of us have to work together to get there. So I think, I think it's important, something like Grow Africa, which brings together large private sector players to try and bring huge investment, which we know the huge investment needs in Africa. We need the big companies, but we also need the social lenders there who are really trailblazing and showing us ways to do, do better, uh, better lending, smarter lending. And the CSOs who keep us always, especially the World Bank Group, making sure that we are, we are um, uh, providing the best that we can to our clients and, the, and in, in every way, not only the financial solutions, but the environmental and social solutions. So, uh, you know, I think it's healthy. I think the best solutions are kind of uncomfortable. It, it takes a, a lot of effort to get there, but then we start coming up with maybe starting to come up with some transformational approaches. Last little time, quick, Will. Sure. So ask us this question in two or three years, because I'm sure we'll be back my popular demands. <laughs> <laughs> what does pathological collaboration look like then? We've got proximity designs in the front row here. We've got Matt from, uh, from uh, One Acre Funds, total leaders on, f on Pathway 5. They're involved in, in, in CSAF, right? right? We're pulling folks in as we move along those, those growth pathways. Excellent, excellent. I want to, so, 
we talked about, in the prep for this, we talked about partnerships. We talked about unlikely partnerships, and then now we're talking about messy partnerships in some sense. Um, and Sean, when we spoke prior to this, the, uh, you had you'd gone a little further into the Grow Africa in three specific examples. One of the questions that I was talking to Tony Kahn uh, about this morning was, in those broad-based uh, uh, partnerships, as they develop collaborations, whatever the name ends up being, who leads? How do you parse out the roles, um, particularly if it's not on a term sheet at the end of the day? How has that been working thus far? Well, I think, um, I mean, a lot of it, you know, because it is new, I, I think it is, you know, it, the, it, it is challenging. Uh, and, and it's challenging the, the paradigm. I mean, what's interesting is, I mean, in a way you did it, you know, even just by default there a little bit in, in the sense of sort of saying, right, because the large companies are involved in Grow Africa, it must be being led by the large companies because traditionally that's where it's come from. And, uh, you know, when actually, you know, the, the leadership is coming out of Africa itself. And for us, it's been responding you know, to that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would laugh to think that we are leading on anything on an Ethiopian context. Uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, yeah, this has very much been, right, Ethiopia setting its agenda and then challenging us, you know, as companies, local and international, through the sort of, you know, interface of something like Grow Africa to... Uh, to, to then engage in that agenda, you know, which is very much being framed at the local level. And uh, so, you know, part of the, the, the challenge with a lot of this is, you know, if you take classic behavioural economics, which are becoming quite, you know, a trendy conversation at the moment, is this whole notion of predisposition bias. You know, the moment you put certain players in the room, people expect that, you know, it's being led by a certain group or whatever. So that's one challenge is to actually realise that often, you know, we, we need to be rethinking, you know, uh, how, we, how we perceive things. Uh, and I think Grow Africa is very much like that. I think because things have traditionally been led from outside of Africa, we don't tend to actually assume that the real leadership is coming from Africa itself. Uh, and, and that's quite a powerful but, you know, subtle sort of shift that's going on. I, I think the other one is the whole concept of entrepreneurship, you know, which we're seeing, which is that, you know, that, that uh, you know, you're, you're seeing examples come out where actually social entrepreneurship, you know, as it stands, can come from anywhere at the moment. Mm. It can come from an institution like the IFC, it can come from, you know, players, you know, like any one of us sitting here, you know, and it, and it can come from local-based organisations, is, you know, I mean, you've got a lot of intrapreneurship happening now within large companies, uh, and that's quite a dynamic, you know, to test. I mean, I personally, I, you know, 10, 15 years as a sort of serial social entrepreneur that's now ended up back in a large company trying to sort of turn that around. Uh, and so I think that the challenge is how do we take entrepreneurship in this space uh, and, and, you know, and, and really give it momentum mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for what it is and not trying to box it. And that's been partly what you know, has been a, a sort of challenge for Grafica. But the third thing I want to say, which has been a key part of Grafica and just listening to it, because it's also what's getting now is you're getting clusters coming together. CSAF, very good example. Yeah. But actually what I'm starting to see is these platforms are starting to compete with each other. So the competition goes away from the individual institutional level to, well, okay, we've agreed to be pre-competitive and we've formed this, you know, network. And then the networks start to <laughs> compete against each other and say, hang on, we're doing that, you know, and you should be doing this. And, uh, and so actually now what is starting to come up, or the term that I've been using, is platform of platforms. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. <laughs> but you've got to have something because actually Grow Africa is not going to be the answer to, you know, by any means everything on, on, on the, you know, agricultural investment front by a long way. But so how does Grow Africa interface with CSAF, interface with the ATA, you know, the Agricultural Transformation o Agency, which are all platforms in their own right at different levels? And, uh, uh, you yeah, which then have a whole series of composite partnerships underneath them or as part of them. Mm. 
Uh, and I think this is also, you know, and I think for finance, this is going to be really tricky because we've tended to think in the finance value chain. Whereas what we're now having to see is, you know, this is beyond just the finance value chain. Right. The complexity of the, of the answers to involve, you know, smallholder farmers and the change that's required and the speed that's going to come on board in somewhere like Africa, you know, is so significant that the, it's going to require a much more dynamic uh, interface, both at an individual organisational level, at a perception level, but also at now this sort of networked level. And so how we can open source a lot of that and all that. I, I probably didn't answer your question. That probably oh, confused right. it. Yeah. So I think about um, trade finance in fair trade and Paul's leadership with Fair Trade USA and the growth of that whole market in the last couple of decades. And like after a while, you're like, that dog can hunt and you know how to embed in that value chain, say in coffee, right? Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of challenges, as we know. Uh, and there's black swan risk in basic bread and butter, trade finance and coffee, we found out last year. Like that, that, that's there. But what you need to do when you move into, say, Yara's supply chain, or you're working in food security nutrition in Burkina Faso, is become a dog whisperer. Like, really understand how that supply chain works. And, and really embed and, and kind of be agnostic in some respects, always respecting your core competency and your specialization as to how you're going to insinuate yourself into that. And it takes a hell of a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. And you have to structure yourself as a team that can listen and like hang out with Sean at World Economic Forum, a colleague of mine, and then your loan officer on the ground in Ghana is talking to the team and like you listen, listen, listen in an institutional way and then you, and then you embed. But like the, the dog whisper thing versus like, where's the dog hunting? It's like <laughs> dog whispering is what it's about for us. All right, so we've got platform of platforms and dog whispering to work with. We need a third. I'm a, I'm a former consultant, we need a third. Um, well actually, let me, let me channel into that a little bit because uh, so Arif, uh, Nakvi yesterday um, talked about uh, building ESG into everything they do, um, and it's a, it's a core value for them. Uh, where the social lenders have been in the past <coughs> have been in markets that were uh, primed for uh, either certification or for agronomic practice that are taught in a uh, sustainable way, um, and it's a more organized supply chain. As you go into these dog whispering required supply chains, how do you maintain that? How do you keep doing that? Mikhail. No, that's definitely where, where indeed the dog whispering uh, becomes an art, I'd say. Because indeed, um, um, to start with certification, which indeed is, uh, has, has shown to be a very powerful tool to, to unlock markets, because essentially that's what, what certification has done globally, is to unlock markets for a lot of smallholder farmers, uh, definitely in Latin America, Latin America, less so in Africa, that's indeed where, where the dog whispering indeed comes, comes more in place. Uh, to unlock those markets for, for these farmers, uh, providing them with a premium that wasn't paid, uh, paid uh, to them before. Um, uh, also, what certification has done is to make things transparent. So to make things more measurable and clear when you're talking about fair trade or organic agriculture. Um, in the absence of certification, and definitely in Africa, a lot of African agriculture is not, not certified, definitely not to the level that we see in Latin America, for instance, or in Asia as well. Um, it really comes down to, to finding alternatives to establish, for us at least, as a social lender again, it's important that we, we, we can establish some form of, of sustainability there, whether that's on a, a social level, farmers, workers are paid a fair, a fair wages or fair prices, or on the agricultural practices that have to be some form of sustainability in there. Um, it could be organic, but it could also be or, uh, towards organic practices. And how to establish that in the absence of a framework of a certification? And that's just, a, that we can call it a challenge, because how do we, um, even if we're, we're on the ground and we have offices and we have staff out there, how do we establish of a, whatever, a, a cooperative of 2,000 farmers whether these 2,000 farmers uh, uh, comply with the, let's say, the standards that we, we have for either the social or the ecological component. Um, we're, 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 indeed, we're whispering, we're, we're, we're listening there, uh, uh, definitely to, uh, with our ear on the ground, how to do that best. We're doing it, uh, but we're learning as we go. Uh, and that's also where, indeed, this cooperation 
or whatever, it's a platform or a node or a, a committee as we have uh, is, is very important because we're all in the same game there. And so how can we establish, how can we unlock the African market for this capital? Uh, in the absence of certification, definitely certification is getting there, but it's not to the level that we yeah, that, that, that would be help us to, to build an infrastructure more uh, to unlock that capital. So how can we do that together? Uh, Root Capital just pu published a, um, something about uh, um, environmental screening, how that, uh, how that can help, how that can strengthen your, your, uh, your investments. And that kind of open space stuff um, is, is crucial for us to build that, that infrastructure. Can I jump feel this gap? Sure, yeah. So, yeah, so we, we, we issued uh, we did an issue brief we published not long ago called basically making the business case for social and environmental due diligence. And to me, like I see Graham back there, I'm not sure if Philip or Bob are here, but from a city's perspective, for instance, the translation effects of what an impact first agricultural lender is the critical thing. What could you what is inherently replicable about what we're doing as social lenders that could get that could get grafted off of our little pilot farm and onto a larger commercial farm? I commercial lender globally. And I think as, you know, building off of the really robust certification systems in place around safe fair trade, um, that you can move beyond that and say as a lender, yeah, we can do our randomized control trials and deep dive impact analysis, but most importantly, can you really hardwire into your due diligence as a loan officer and train up your local loan officers? How you can, at cost, really understand, for instance, that if you understand the social dynamics within a farmer enterprise, that digging into that, but in a systemized way, helps you to be a better lender. And if you understand the impact of climate change and erratic weather on resilience or lack thereof of the farmers on the ground, that actually lowers your risk as a lender. So if you can create that public good as CSAF, and we really embrace that, that, you know, maybe none of them are going to be leaning into windmills like we do around reaching, you know, the true smallholder farmers in the least served segment of the market. But to me, that's where, in some respects, that's the blueprint where it starts to let a thousand flowers bloom to mix my metaphor, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's nothing new in there, though, so I don't have my third uh, quotable yet. The, uh, you talked earlier in your, your comments um, about the symbiosis between technical assistance and different forms of it and the lending. Can you talk about, in, in that context, how technical assistance providers and what role they play and I think I saw Simon Winter walk in at some point, so if he's got some comments on it as well, that would be helpful. Actually, yeah. let's just go to Simon. Do you want to go straight away. to me? Um, thank you. Um, so uh, as a technical service, a technical assistance provider, we do capacity development of small farmers, of their organizations, of their buyers, the aggregators, the processors, et cetera, in ag value chains uh, across the developing world. Um, and before I go into the role of technical assistance, I just think there's one thing that, as I'm listening to this conversation, that's very important for me, uh, for us to bear in mind here. And Willie got it a little bit when he was just talking about uh, Fair Trade USA. And that is, at the end of the day, that finance and technical assistance, they're, they're both enablers. And, and what we're enabling here is small farmers to grow their products better so they can get access to markets better so they can increase their incomes. So we're talking about something that's real at the end of this. Um, and all this stuff that we're talking about here is how do we shape that real agenda in a way that actually creates more value for the participants uh, in those chains. So I just think it's very important for us to bear that in mind because we can get very sort of caught up in platforms and tools and platforms and platforms and dog whispering and so on. But at the end of the day, we're actually talking about poor people <coughs> getting a little less poor. Um, so the role that technical assistance plays uh, is really in, 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 in the first instance is in, in understanding that, how, how does that value get created? Um, which are the right products? What's the right productivity levels? How do you get there from your starting point? And what are the investments then that are needed both in terms of skill building, uh, in terms of new seeds, uh, in terms of access to fertilizers and so on that enables you know, low income, low productivity farmers, uh, often subsistence farming, uh, to move out of that. Um, one acre fund is a great starting point, but how do you build on that so that these uh, farmers can become commercial over time? So then going from that to how does technical assistance actually enable finance, which I think is really what 
Tom's question was. Uh, I just had a few thoughts. Um, so one I think is um, farmers on their own or co-ops on their own typically who are coming off that kind of background aren't able to walk into banks. They're not able to walk into even root capital or other social lenders uh, and get access to finance immediately. They need to be supported in terms of understanding their own finances, improving their financial literacy, having business plans, et cetera, et cetera, understanding what their cash flows are, where their margins come from, and all that kind of stuff. And so the technical assistance providers can uh, enable all of that. Uh, secondly, if they are trying to get organized and better organized, there's a whole piece around governance um, that's really important. Um, uh, a lot of co-ops have traditionally or have evolved to become very political uh, animals and not business-like. Um, and we need to sort of reset that trajectory, improve governance, uh, and link to improving governance is improving transparency as well um, in the chains, but transparency between the buyers, the co-ops, and the farmers, and having the members of the co-ops being able to understand that as much as the buyers and the lenders. Um, Technoserve uh, in the coffee sector in Africa has helped develop something called coffeetransparency.com, which we think is a sort of blueprint of, you know, a direction for the future around improving transparency so that lenders can actually have confidence in uh, the information they're getting, knowing that it's coming off direct sales, off direct production, uh, and so on, um, as the season is progressing. Um, the third piece of technical assistance is actually educating the lenders as well. Um, and you know, you've got specialized lenders here like Triodos, Shared Interest, uh, Root Capital, and so on, who have spent a lot of time trying to figure out ag value chains. But you go to commercial banks, um, like Standard Bank, or Barclays, or Citi, or others uh, that are interested in this space, they don't necessarily have ag specialists who understand the technical <laughs> details of uh, you know, crop cycles and uh, the risk and so on. So there's a, there's a big piece of uh, educating the lenders. And then uh, finally, uh, and then I'll stop, uh, in terms of the types of technical assistance, I think the third one is shaping the enabling, or fourth one, sorry, is shaping the enabling environment as well. Often you're dealing with, you know, regulatory frameworks, policy frameworks, lack of infrastructure, and so on. And there's a role for technical assistance advisors in, in informing that, so that again, that the financing risk is reduced for, uh, for the lenders and for the financiers. And then finally, uh, my last point is that I think it's very important to think about technical assistance as a two-step process. Um, so step one is really a capital investment uh, kind of piece. It's often uh, taking providers, uh, sorry, taking farmers, their organizations, the small growing businesses that are buying from them and helping aggregate their produce or store it or whatever. Uh, it, it's taking them from a kind of, let's say, low level of competence, low level of organization, low level of business professionalism and so on to a higher one. And that's quite an intense process and it's quite expensive and that cost can't really be absorbed within the cost of goods sold through the value chain. There's a need for subsidy at that point. Um, and there's a need for skills and expertise and knowledge uh, to be deployed. But step two is if this is going to create an exit to a market system that's going to be operating with, it, with, uh, with its uh, internal financial dynamics not requiring a subsidy, which we believe is possible, uh, you get into a sort of operating cost period. Uh, but you need to know what the economics are of that operating cost before you make the capital investment because otherwise you're, you're creating a perpetual subsidy and that's not a good thing. So it's very important to do the homework for that two-step process right up front. And step two should not need a Technoserve or a Root Capital or an IFC or, or any of us as these kind of intermediaries because that should be a market system operating under its local uh, structures with you know local commercial banks, local NGOs, local co-ops, uh, and local markets operating, uh, hopefully into the future. Gotcha. Thank you, Simon. Um, hey, sure. Just build on that because I think mean, this is really important, and you know, getting this this right. And I think the the technical assistance we're seeing coming in because. It, yeah, at different levels, I think you know, particularly somewhere like Africa, the technical assistance piece is going to be critical uh, because you know the whole concept of financing is you know is not there uh, traditionally. The banks don't have any exposure to it. You know, there's been very limited history of impact investors. Um, I, I was just going to you know maybe. 
pull on Chris Isaac for a second from AgDevCo because you've just also been you know doing this quite a bit. But just to try and you know, how do you get that balance right between technical assistance and because uh, because in a way there's been two layers. One has been the business itself, and then that there's actually been the the, the sort of getting businesses to work with businesses, you know, a seed producer to work with a, you know, to, to work with a sort of maize grower, you know, and pulling them together to then look at even a higher level of, you know, combined, you know, where blended capital might come in at a different level. So there's those sort of different levels of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot, Chris. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Chris Isaac from AgDevCo. Um, so we are a social impact investor. Uh, we invest in agriculture, SMEs. And I think the question is, is there sufficient capital reaching the SMEs on the ground that are going to be working with small farmers and linking them to markets. The hub commercial farms, the agri-processing businesses, the logistics companies. These are businesses that need risk capital, certainly, and they often need maybe half a million dollars, a million dollars. They also need a lot of support to, to grow their businesses, be it financial management or, or governance or marketing strategies. And it's very difficult for them to raise capital. Um, so uh, the, what they really need is venture capital. But venture capital looks for venture capital returns, and they simply aren't on offer when these are pioneering businesses in very tough markets. And, and for m many of the reasons Willie was talking about, the transaction costs of getting started, the uncertain legal environments. So there's a need for, for social venture capital that's willing to accept a lower return, but it will, will measure very carefully the impact it's getting. And the challenge is who's going to provide that funding? Um, because you can't expect it will come from the private capital markets. So this is where the concept of blending comes in. It's going to have to be a mix of traditional aid, of philanthropic money and of, and of commercial money that together will accept a 0 to 10% return, taking early stage risks into pioneering businesses that if they grow will link to the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of small farmers and connect them to markets. But it's risky, and there will be failures. That's the nature of venture capital. It is that technical assistance piece as well. And, and so because it's venture capital, it's providing a lot more than just the money. It's working in partnership with those businesses over the long term. And agriculture is a 10, 15, 20-year undertaking. You're not going to be able to uh, exit within three to five years. So I think that's uh, there is a challenge there for the traditional funders of how we bring together partnerships at the funding level and get institutions working in new ways so we can pool that funding and accept a, a blended return that's willing to take on those challenges. Thanks, thanks. We've heard a fair amount um, of context on this in terms of the Latin American markets and in terms of the African market. Um, there are folks here who are doing a lot of business in Asia, um, and I just wanted to call them out and ask for their perspectives. And particularly, uh, I know Jim and Debbie Taylor are here from Proximity. Uh, and they are exploring and have grown a direct-to-farmer model. Um, and just to briefly talk about the context that you're operating in and how it may differ from what we're hearing. Hi. Um, yeah, and, well, Myanmar is kind of an extreme environment <laughs> in that <laughs> there's really no functional banking system and um, we're, we have very little um, very low cell phone coverage after North Korea. So we're kind of off the charts um, in terms of infrastructure. And so, and, and we are dealing with what uh, one economist has called a credit famine. Um, so that's just the uh, context that we're working in. And, and we've backed into direct to s um, farmer lending after a Cyclone Nargis hit, and we were involved in farm recovery work for two and a half million people. So and farmers came to us and said, okay, we really like uh, the free fertilizer and packages you've given us, you've saved our lives. Um, but what we really need is a steady source of capital every season. Um, and they were spending eight to 10% a month interest um, for informal loans, that was our only source. So for smallholder farms in, I mean, there are about seven million of them, um, in Myanmar, we saw this huge need, and we saw that the private sector was not coming anytime soon or interested. So there was a um, huge need just not um, addressing this 
backbone of the agrarian economy. Um, and so we've, uh, you know, started out, we've gotten a microfinance license, and I think the challenge for us is uh, we didn't, we're lending directly to farmers, and we know the risks involved, and as well as the high costs. And, um, but we came up at it from a design and innovation point of view, <laughs> and extremely user-focused and user-centered, um, customer service-oriented, uh, very farmer-centered. So, um, in saying, you know, the tr traditional microfinance doesn't work for farmers, because um, they were telling us they hate it. Um, they're, they're, they hate the biweekly payments. It doesn't match their cash flows, and on and on and on. And it's and it's peri-urban. It doesn't, you know, they don't fall into that category. So we saw this huge unmet need, and decided to really, you know, apply design thinking and user-centered um, sort of design for designing services that really match farmers. Um, so we're at 33,000 borrowers now, and I have a, a pretty small loan book of six million and been building it. But we've had pretty good repayment rates of 99%. Um, so, and I think our, um, one way we've dealt with the risks is uh, we've also innovated with farm advisory services. Um, again, after the cyclone, saw that there was, um, farmers had no access to independent knowledge for pests and diseases and diag diagnosing, you know, and treating them. And so um, they were going to pesticide shops in town. Um, and so we also came at it from a design point of view and said, you know, what, what do farmers want? They said they wanted something low cost, simple, and high impact. Um, so we saw the need to really design best fit practices instead of best practices. Um, best fit practices for Myanmar farmers um, and pick the, you know, the top, figure out what the top 10 pests and diseases are um, that they're dealing with. So we've designed a um, mobile app for farmers as well um, that um, hopefully they'll be able to use soon. We're, we're testing it right now. Um, yeah, I think that's... Thanks. Well, basically we're, we're, coop we're also collaborating with frog design um, to look at, you know, just be very user focused on this and take and see what we can do. Great, thanks. Don Seville, I see you nodding uh, quite vigorously. Could you comment? Yeah, hi, I'm Don Seville from a group called the Sustainable Food Lab, and we've been bringing together companies, NGOs, uh, certification organizations around smallholder sourcing for about 10 years. Um, and I just wanted to offer maybe a quick reframe uh, that part of what we're trying to do is really unleash farmer investment, that the credit is one of the tools, but we also want to keep in mind, and you know, Willie was alluding to this, you know, Simon with Susan Plus was saying, is that critical to this is building the value proposition for farmers that this is a good investment to invest in this crop. And what we've seen in cocoa, what we've seen in other crops, is that the financial training for farmers to be able to make good decisions about investment is just as imp important as the agronomic training, just as important to the access uh, to credit. Um, and that further we have to keep an eye on to the ever-extending payment terms along the chain so that it's, you know, for many cash crop supply chains can be a year between when you plant and when the final brand makes the payment in the chain. So credit is an absolute critical uh, function to survive that kind of payment term. Um, but we want to continue challenging, are the prices well set up for a good value proposition to the farmers? Uh, is the productivity and all the pieces add up for it to be a good farmer investment? So just as we talk about um, expanding smallholder finance, which is an absolutely critical piece, um, our request would be in the lens of this is really just it's a piece of helping farmers unleash their investment in crops. And we need that ecosystem to come together to help provide uh, the changes to the system, the support to farmers, uh, and, and really help them make good decisions about what's worth investing and not. And this is all, you guys all know this, I just want to kind of call this out.
Thanks. Uh, I want to open it up now. I've been sort of calling people out and doing different things, and we'll, we'll uh, go for a few minutes longer, I think. Question? Thank you. Um, Neil Lacroix from Mondelez International. I'd just like to come at it from the point of view of the sort of multinationals. Um, you know, we're, we're undertaking quite a few programs investing in our commodity supply chains, which are predominantly smallholder based. Um, and the, the, <coughs> the goal of this investment is to ensure livelihood, the farmers make a livelihood and actually you know, farming is a viable career option. Um, from our point of view, if that doesn't happen, uh, people are leaving farming and we've got a major supply problem. So um, in our programs, particularly on cocoa and coffee, uh, we're, we're, what we're doing is investing a lot of work and technical training to improve productivity. Uh, but one of the other very strong needs that's come out of our value chain analysis is precisely is um, finance, access to finance. And as Don was saying, um, very much linked to that is the business skills because quite frankly it's irresponsible to give people access to finance if you're not going to give them the skills to be able to handle it. Where for us <laughs> the big challenge is doing this at scale. You know we're working with you know we can do you know you can do this on you know, 2,000, 5,000 farmers. We're talking about uh, training groups of 20,000, 50,000 farmers. And you know we don't know the answer to that, and I'd be interested to know, sort of get some sort of thoughts on this. How do we? And we're also working through quite long supply chains. You know, we buy from exporters who are both either global traders or local exporters, who will be buying through various layers of middlemen or collectors. And you've got the smallholders at the end, and frequently the smallholders aren't that organised. So from our side, you know, how on earth do we get around? How do we develop access to finance mechanisms in this sort of situation? Mm -hmm. And to be honest, this is one of the reasons why I'm here. We'd be really interested in, you know, getting some th input and some suggestions on this. Thoughts from the panel? Oh, well, one collaboration that we're exploring, I mentioned before, is working more closely with EFAD, which has a deeper sort of technical knowledge about smallhold farmers and how to how to create co-ops and how to invest in co invest in the sense of invest in literacy and training in the development of co-ops because IFC again we have an advisory services business but we don't have expertise in that I mean what you're looking for I I, I would attest probably we're all looking for something like that and I looked at TechnoServe and the other uh, technical service providers that have the deep expertise there um, agree we we need these things so I guess the 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 thing that we're trying to do also is knowing that there are other agencies like EFAD, like FAO, like World, World Food Program that are deeply embedded into these uh, supply, supply chains as well from a different angle, from the pro-poor angle rather than the pro-commercial angle. Yeah. How can we work with them and see how we can draw out their technical um, skill set and, and who are they working with to improve these things? That's one way. So, right, you know, silver buckshot, no, no serve a bullet, of course, but Speaking on behalf of the Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance and Responsibility and Shared Interest and Chodos and, and the others uh, that are involved, I feel like we're, I love that Bob Baniba this morning used the term boutique of expertise. And we're kind of boutiques of expertise. And yet to the extent that, that we, and this is I think what's so powerful about the Initiative for Smallholder Finance's work, the ISF's work, is to the extent that we push ourselves and kind of ecosystem players, including investors and donors, push us from uh, pathway one into two, and into three, and into four, and into five, and we create those blueprints and those public goods, that if we can nail it with Yara, for instance, uh, and, uh, and, and all of the dog whispering that that's going to take, that, and, and the curriculum is, is something that could be applied on, in any number of places, um, and the structures and all the different pieces that the blueprinting of that is something that could be highly replicable for your situation. So I think in us, in our case, it's incumbent upon us to be, uh, to work together to create those blueprints and to move beyond, not that there isn't a ton more work to be done in pathway one and two in exportable cash crop value chains, but as we move beyond that, I think at, at least we can speak with a certain level of confidence, we're playing our little part, we're the little, one little piece of buckshot. 
And because uh, I, I wanted to link this conversation to uh, a point that Simon made, which is very valid, because at the end of the day, this comes down often to an individual farmer, you know, who's got to make, uh, and there is no way they're going to deal with a really complicated conversation. It's to your point, you know, they 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 just want financial, you know, they they want to be able you, to be presented a, a sort of ca cash benefit analysis for that particular crop that they can understand based on the dynamics of their local market. And that they're, because they're betting, you know, their family resources or whatever on that. What we've got to do is somehow have that conversation, which is incredibly important and, and be engaging. And that's where, you know, the training and the technical, you know, what techno serve and all that is doing. And then behind that, there's got to be another conversation going on, which is how do you link you know, uh, village savings and loans to a micro bank, to a large bank with a, you know, cr with a crop insurance underlay, you know, under that, which may mean sort of, you know, getting weather data from cell phone towers and using cash transfers where the governments are sort of sceptical about that at the moment. So you've got to bring MasterCard or Visa card in to take some of the transactional risk so it's not sitting on all the, on, on the, on the bank balance of a, you know, of a cell phone company with the kind of blended finance that Chris is doing and getting the institutions, you know, to Laura's point that you're getting the right people in organisations of IFAD and that, you know, who really understand this finance piece sort of talking about that, all coming together and figuring out, you know, what is a very just simple product that you can be communicating to an individual farmer in Vietnam or in Ghana. And, and I think, you know, that, uh, and in a way, these are two, you know, quite different pieces. And that's nothing, then you've got the whole legislative framework around that and, you know, whether uh, reserve banks are even set up to do a lot of this stuff and, you know, uh, and the complexities of trade finance and, you know, sort of those issues. So, uh, you know, in a way, we have to have, be having these different conversations, but making sure that those conversations are happening not separately, which they often happen to have been done so far, but we're actually having them and, and we're making sure that they're reinforcing each, you know, each other and we're learning and there's a mutual feedback loop there, uh, which often only happens randomly at events like this as opposed to sort of, you know, strategically. Uh, it's a fairly random mm. connection. All right, one last question and then I think we'll, we'll close. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Colin Masha. Uh, we uh, run an agricultural finance franchise model that uh, lends, this year will be lending about $2 million uh, to smallholder maize farmers in northern Nigeria. Um, I, have to, I have to respectfully say I, I somewhat disagree with thinking of this as a messy challenge. Um, I actually don't think it's that complicated. Um, there are some enablers that are missing to enable things to scale faster, but those are not terribly, uh, terribly challenging. Um, the reality is that um, if you look at the key enablers for an agricultural, someone who's financing smallholder farmers like us, what we need, uh, we need basically three things. The first is we need to be ensure that we can get access to, uh, to sustainable, reasonably priced capital. Now, the, um, the reality is I don't believe that agricultural finance should be, f two smallholder farmers should be a standalone entity where you're providing credit alone. The reality is the cost to serve that client, um, if the, you had to price that into your credit, it would, it, it would price it, you know, your credit would be priced out for the market. So for us, we're able to deliver credit to smallholder farmers at really only a 700 basis points over our cost of capital because we're able to have multiple other revenue streams from selling them inputs, from marketing their products, so on and so forth, that basically amortize our fixed costs. And the beauty of agriculture is that, you know, all these different fixed costs, when you're dispersing the input, uh, the credit, when you're dispersing the inputs, and when you're marketing the product, are all at different times, you can use the same resources across that. Now, so, but the critical challenge we faced in accessing capital is a lot of the capital, social capital that's available, tends to not want to take local currency risk. And the reality is, as much as I love chocolate, and I love cocoa, and uh, coffee, uh, Nigeria, that's less than half a percent of the agriculture market. 
and and it's not going to unless you're able to 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 target those stable crops you're really not going to have the massive impact and i think willie talked about that so the reality is that if we can't think about a way in which to help investors who want to support this take somebody create a mechanism for taking off that um, that forex risk and we've had some discussions around working with central banks of countries to say okay look let's create a fund that will basically uh, look at uh, carrying the um, the cost of hedging and so on and so forth uh, to to help groups like I think I know responsibility for example uh, you know, that's a critical challenge that uh, some of their teams have mentioned then the second thing that you need is you need human capacity you need to build your loan officers you need to get out there get them going so how do we create uh, with techno servants so sort of create it it's a new class of uh, of individual that is a smallholder microfinance support expert. They need to be able to support the entire activity, and we need to think of it more as less as uh, just agricultural finance, but more as SME finance. These guys are SMEs. How do we make them uh, as a standardized business very successful? And that's why we've used the franchising model, where effectively. Uh, the power of franchising is standardization. That's why we focus only on maize, because I know how to get a smallholder farmer in northern Nigeria to get yields that are equivalent to a farmer in Brazil or, uh, or almost some parts of the U.S. And then the final piece is risk management in the case of recourse. The reality is the, um, if you lend to a small person, I'm not really interested to understand how they do it in Myanmar, we don't have a small, um, I the equivalent would be, um, a s I, what's, what's the term? Uh, in the US, they had the, the, the show People's Court, a small claims court. <laughs> so how do we create a small claims court? Uh, and it's been done, it's one of the things that I think has inspired the growth of the, of the Brazilian uh, agricultural finance space. It's this very standard, easy process that if you're a lender that you've lent to somebody and they've defaulted, you don't have, you have a very simple process you can go through to try to get back your, uh, your principal. So those are, those are the things that from an from a ecosystem, I agree that it, we need to think about an ecosystem, but I, we, we shouldn't think of it too complex. It sh it's not that complex. Okay, a fair, a fair counterpoint. Um, well, thank you very much for engaging in this very uh, rich conversation. Obviously, we're taking on a lot and it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting place to be in the market. Thank you to the panelists um, for your comments. Any last words? One last word, which is there's, a, there's an event tomorrow at 11.30 or something that is about building an industry, talking about blueprinting, uh, not just sustainable food or smallholder agricultural finance, but beyond that. So if you want to continue the conversation, a little plug for that tomorrow. Yes, you yeah. stole my plug. So thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you, Edward. <laughs>